I'm Hans Giesecke, Executive Director, and I'm so pleased to see you all here this evening. Our speaker tonight, Maria Echeveste, is a former top advisor to President Bill Clinton and served as the White House Deputy Chief of Staff in the second Clinton administration. One of the highest ranking Latinas to have served in a presidential administration, she is currently a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress and a co-founder of the Nueva Vista Group, a policy, legislative strategy, and advocacy group working with both nonprofit and corporate clients. She is a lecturer at our Across the Street Neighbor, the University of California Berkeley Boltall School of Law, and a senior fellow with its Chief Justice Earl Warren Institute on Race, Ethnicity, and Diversity. Throughout her professional life, she has worked continuously on improving the lives of Americans through progressive ideas and actions. Building on the achievements of progressive pioneers such as Teddy Roosevelt and Martin Luther King Jr., her work with the Center for American Progress has addressed a number of ongoing 21st century challenges such as energy, national security, economic growth and opportunity, immigration, education, and health care. Ms. Estevesta continues to provide strategic and policy advice to a wide variety of corporate, nonprofit, and union clients through her consulting firm. In terms of her education, she received a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology from Stanford University and then her Juris Doctor from the University of California, Berkeley. Given that this is big game week here at Cal, it will be interesting to hear from her how she handles her divided loyalties during a tense time like this one. Needless to say, someone with her political acumen and strategy sense will understand how important it is to support both teams but still pick a winner. <laughs> Perhaps the same can be said about this election season. While many of us continue to struggle with understanding the true dynamics of the election process, it will be very helpful to consider the various demographic factors that will largely determine the outcome that we are all so eager to see materialize in the next several weeks. So, without much further ado, let's welcome our speaker tonight, Maria Echeveste. Maria. It's wonderful to be here, and I want to just say thank you so much for the invitation. Um, thank you to iHouse. I'm honored, actually, to have been invited uh, to speak to you all about the presidential election. And uh, I will say that Dr. Liliane Crizal and I struggled a bit on uh, what we should call this discussion. Um, because I have many, many interests and have opinions on many, many issues. But we decided that we would focus on demographic changes and its possible impact on the presidential election by focusing on the demographic changes and what they might mean to the ultimate result in the election. But I want to be very clear that this discussion about demographic changes and its impact is, cannot be a discussion solely about demographic changes. That is to say, there are many, especially in the media, who are very prone to focus on things like um, majority white vote seems to be supporting candidate Governor Romney, majority of minorities are supporting uh, President Obama. And I think that when you look at it that narrowly, it is a disservice to the millions of Americans who will be voting. That is to say, no one is just one thing, as uh, to borrow a phrase from it, Professor Edward Said. Why am I stressing this? I believe our media and our political pundits keep trying to tell us that the electorate is racialized. 
And while I will be absolutely at the forefront to say race in America and difference in ethnicity is as uh, intense and as um, difficult as it has ever been, the reality is that mo Americans care about many of the same issues. I have traveled this country I started to add up the states, and I'm not quite at 50, but pretty close. And what you find is that, yes, there are differences, but most people want the same thing. Indeed, I would say everyone wants the same thing. You know, security in their home, um, good schools, good jobs, a dignified retirement, health care. So you wonder, what is this yin and yang of focus on diversity, but if we all want the same thing, why is it that we can't figure out a path to that place. Well, we do know one thing. Both campaigns, and uh, even before that, the primaries, have spent millions of dollars trying to figure out what are those issues that Americans care about? All that polling, all that focus group. Um, what's the most important issue? What will motivate them to vote? Is it tax cuts? Is it Libya? Is it Iran? The deficit? Health care? Immigration? What is it? Or is it, as some people have been suggesting, really as simple as it's the economy, stupid? Um, as famously said by James Carvel 20 years ago. Now, I can say that since I worked on that campaign. And I can tell you that while James Carvel may think that it was that simple, uh, those of us working on the campaign understood that it wasn't just that that in fact you needed to do specific outreach to different groups to talk about these issues and how the economy and how their concerns. In some ways, I've come to believe that what Americans want is uh, an acknowledgement of their identity, but also a connection that we all understand that we're Americans. Now, all the big issues the deficit, the economy, jobs, how we compete in a global economy, um, opportunity, need to be seen through the prism of the salad bowl, the mosaic, whatever metaphor you like to describe the American electorate. Can I say it again? We are not monolithic. Multiracial, multiethnic, multireligious, multifood. Have you tried to throw a dinner party? In Berkeley? I have. You have to have a meat dish, a seafood dish, and a vegetarian dish, and God forbid you have a vegan. I once had a guest who was allergic to six things, two of which were normal, but I digress. The po my point is that you cannot focus on the issues without understanding the electorate in all of its complexity. But if you only focus on the demographics, that one category, you could lose an election. So I want to start first with an examination of that electorate and then discuss the various ways these demographic changes may play in the upcoming election. And lastly, some thoughts on the future elections in our democracy. So let's see if I can master the 21st century. One thing I want to focus on, the country. Where is it growing? From this slide, and first, let me please uh, give credit. This is a compilation of various slides. Um, yes, I spend my, a lot of time looking at politics and the electorate. Chris Crom from the Institute on Southern Studies in North Carolina, Dr. Robert Jones and Daniel Cox from the Public Religion Research Institute, and Dr. Rui uh, Teixeira from the Center for American Progress, one of my colleagues. So, you can see from this slide that uh, the growth is in the south, right? Oops. And how does this play out? Well, that population growth determines the allocation and the redistricting of the congressional seats, which impacts the electoral college. And what do we have here? Those numbers are gained the blue are the gained, and the yellow are the 
places and states that lost seats. You can see a dramatic shift. Another thing to consider, this country which was founded on religious liberty is, in fact, a very religious but changing electorate. And I thought this was an interesting slide because it shows some changes. From 74 to 2010, the decrease in white Protestant, the almost level black Protestant, the increase in white Catholic, and the unaffiliated. There, I'll show you another slide in a bit that's gonna make some of this, I think, very relevant to the electoral politics. Geographic distribution of Christian groups. Um, the, uh, Dr. Robert Jones and Daniel Cox looked at where the different denominations were, where the different denominations were. And I think this is a very dramatic slide. It shows a deep Southern Baptist denomination in the South, um, pockets of Methodists, Catholic, uh, Mormon. Something to think about as we try to figure out which state is going to vote which way. Another interesting data point is the increase in uh, Catholics, but what percentage of the increase in Catholics is due to the increase in population of Hispanics? At one point, it was 10 to 1 white to Hispanic uh, Catholic, now it's 2 to 1. And many say, um, and I think they would be right, that the Catholic Church's support and indeed advocacy for immigration reform is directly tied to who their parishioners are. Without Hispanics coming into this country as immigrants, the Catholic Church might very well be reduced in size. Now, where are African Americans? Steady percentage, about 12%. You can see from this map the concentrations. Growth in the Asian American community. A small community, but it can be very significant in certain places, certainly the Northwest, but Colorado, Arizona, Northern Virginia, while small, it can also uh, play a pivotal role when you're trying to figure out if you have enough votes to make 51%. Now this is, I think, the map or the slide that many of our pundits keep focusing on, which is the demographic change and the movement toward majority people of color. And that somehow that is going to result in, uh, in some Democrats' uh, wishful dreams that it'll mean a democratic control. And we're going to unpack some of those assumptions because not all communities of color think the same way and not all communities within uh, each community, not all parts of one community, think the same way. Um, dare I say it, Americans have opinions and perspectives that are not solely determined by who, what color they are, what religion they are, where they grew up. But when you are running an election and you're trying to figure out what's the right message, how do I get to X candidate, you really are trying to find those proxies. And sometimes, and so far to a great degree, race, ethnicity, religion, level of education are useful proxies. The other thing that if you think of the slide before in terms of where the communities of color are, the majority, which is basically sort of that southern tier, Who's young? Eight, 18 to 34. It totally correlates with the uh, communities where a major, majority of people of color 
So what does that say? It says communities of color, America's future is diverse, increasingly minority. Now, I want to take a moment to delve into one group which, um, not surprisingly, I spend a lot of time looking at, uh, which is the Hispanic community. And uh, I really want to stress this. Part of my job over the last 25 years is trying to explain to political pundits, to political operatives, people who make the decisions on where to spend the money, that if you're trying to reach the Hispanic vote, well, first off, we can't decide what to call ourselves. We're Hispanic, we're Latino, and there are even pockets of Chicano. You could be in New York and you're Boricua, um, Central Americans. We're not monolithic. It used to be, even in 1992, my involvement in the Latino outreach, which I was the national director for Bill Clinton's campaign, was basically the campaign thought uh, we should spend some money in Spanish language advertising in some key states to know, to show that we care. Well, Latinos are 53, when they check the census, 53%, almost 35 checked other race, and there are some demographers who are convinced that they, Latinos check other race because they're confused. What they don't understand is that for many of us, and I include myself in this since I handled our families filling out the census, that these categories have social significance. And I, for one, could not check white. That to me suggests European American. I can't check off black, so I check off other. What's happening, and you're, uh, indeed, the census for 2020, the Office of Management and Budget, is taking comment and beginning to have um, a process to possibly include a racial category of Hispanic. So this process of racializing Latinos, that's a whole nother lecture, a whole nother discussion, but it's relevant because in the political world, when you are fighting with campaign managers, and you would say, well, you need to talk to Latinos and do some ads that respect them and do it in English. Their view was, well, we're just gonna, we'll do it in English. They're like everybody else. Well, not when 35% are checking something else. There must be something going on with the identity. The other one is, I don't know why they keep thinking that the thing to do is buy more advertising for Univision and Telemundo. The majority of Hispanic Americans speak English. Indeed, the debate about whether Hispanics, you know, are uh, the recently uh, Sam Huntington, who, was, who wrote about the ways in which, in his view, the Hispanic immigration was changing American society for, uh, for ill, arguing that they weren't learning English. By the third generation, only 5% speak Spanish. I can tell you in my own family, my parents are from Mexico, I spoke Spanish first. Of their 13 grandchildren, only three speak Spanish. Generation, this is another very important issue. People assume, especially with the debate about immigration, that Hispanics are recent immigrants, right? Well, actually, no. The majority are native born, and that doesn't mean just the children of immigrants. You have places like Colorado, New Mexico, and others, parts of Texas, multi-generational. The differences in those countries, ethnic origin, there is a difference. Mexico is different from El Salvador, it has a different history. Puerto Rico, Cuban, Dominican, all of those have consequences for how people view their place in the world. And if you are a political operative and don't understand that maybe you shouldn't put a Cuban sounding um, announcer in an ad in Los Angeles, you are going to lose some votes. And then economic. Not everyone is a farm worker. 
Not everyone is in low-income jobs. And so unless you understand these various um, slicing and dicing, you're not going to have a very effective uh, voter contact, voter outreach. Young, very young. The median age, uh, if you look at the last line, those under 18, those under 18, over 50% in California are Hispanic under 18. 30% in Colorado, 39% in Nevada. Those have consequences for the policies in terms of education, in terms of healthcare, in terms of investment in human capital. And that gives you just a different way of looking at that. And poor. Um, one of the things we know about talking to voters or who are likely to vote now let me step for a moment. There's been a tremendous amount of interest in Latinos in this election cycle. But the big question that they keep asking is, will they come out to vote? Unless you understand the youth of the population and the economic level, you will not be able to forecast what number comes out to vote. Because what do we know? If you're younger, if you're less educated, you don't vote. So while, so while the Pew Hispanic Center put out a report about um, two weeks ago that said there were 24 million Hispanics eligible to vote in this election cycle, which means that any number below, pick a number, 60% is going to look, look shoddy in terms of turnout. That's really not a fair comparison unless you understand these issues of the economic and the youth. Religion, I mentioned earlier in terms of Catholicism, but another little known fact, which is worth exploring, is the increase in growth in evangelicals uh, among Hispanics. And before we assume that, at least as a Democrat, I'll put my partisan hat on, that those Hispanics are lost to progressive politics, I have had conversations with evangelical preachers who serve the Hispanic community who are upfront and say they believe in economic opportunity, they believe there's a role for government, they may differ on issues like gay marriage or abortion, but there are other issues in which there can be common ground. And unless we, as political operatives, recognize that, we could lose votes by not reaching out to folks that we would otherwise think would not be with us. So you can see, I think, dramatically why in 2012 the Hispanic vote has become such a, shall we say, um, not a hot topic, but almost is like if you can get the Latino vote. But the critical place is Nevada, Colorado, Florida, Virginia. Now another thing is youth, and I'm talking all youth, the millennials, those born early 1980s through the end of 99s. That population is coming, coming to the polls, and as you can see, in 2008, the great majority went for Obama. The question is, what happens in 2012? And also the minority vote. So the battleground states that I mentioned, now everyone always focuses on Ohio. Indeed, I know um, a progressive donor who basically uh, is pushing the national popular vote. I don't know if any of you are familiar, but basically it would do away with the electoral college. It would be a straight popular vote so that, in fact, every vote would matter. You wouldn't have to spend all just focused on one state. Um, there are criticisms of that uh, because it kind of may tilt the balance to uh, urban areas as opposed to rural areas. 
And there is in, indeed a very difference in terms of an analysis of 2008, of 2004 of Ohio, which Kerry lost, was that there was very strong support for Kerry in the urban areas, but the lack of support, enough inroads in the rural surrounding area on Ohio cost, cost the election. Now, when you're looking at Democratic voters, uh, and as the pundits have been constantly harping on, you know, where are the white votes going? It is the white working class that keeps shifting towards the Republican side. So that ends our slideshow. As you can tell, I'm still a novice at the 21st century. I still don't have a Facebook, but my 10 year and 11 year old do, which is scary. So what does this mean for this current election? I think, as you can see from the map, where the battleground states are, where the populations of color are, there is no question that places like Colorado and Nevada, Florida, Virginia, Ohio with the African American vote and urban vote will be critical. Now, there's a report that I saw today that Romney has moved his campaign operations out of North Carolina, signaling that he thinks that state is in the bag. Now, Obama won that state with about 12,000 votes, 14,000 votes. So if true, that presents uh, an issue. Is North Carolina necessary for President Obama to get to 270? No. Uh, does he need to make that up through Nevada and Colorado and New Mexico? Yes. Now, the question that I've been struggling with and my frustration with the pundits who keep focusing on the race and ethnicity of the supporters for Obama, for Romney, is that they, I think, are missing the essential point. Americans are diverse, which means that to be elected president, you must appeal to a wide range of people, to a multiracial, multiethnic, multireligious, multieconomic part of the electorate. And I guess what I really want to stress, if you learn anything from this discussion, is that when you see the headlines, Latinos were key to electing Obama, or white rural voters were key to electing Romney, to understand that it wasn't just that piece, that in fact, as a friend of mine once said, you need the 40 to 44% of your base, but then you need the next five, six points in order to win. And if you only focus on the swing vote, that five, six, without paying attention to your base, you lose. And if you only focus on the base, you lose on the swing, swing voters. It seems to me I'm dumbfounded by what seems to me very clear that you actually have to talk to each of these groups in order to reach 51, that the fact that our political machine, machinery doesn't do it that way. I can't tell you the countless battles we've had. I've been in rooms. Is it the swing? Is it the base? You're not talking to Latinos. You're not talking to African Americans. You're not talking to women. You're not talking to Asians. Well, we are all part of this electric. Now, let me give you The race is tightening up, as we are all aware. In the months after the election, we will all be reading ad nauseum analysis if Obama loses, was it the first debate, a la Kennedy-Nixon. If Obama wins, we will be analyzing whether Romney lost the women's vote, 
uh, with his binders full of women, resumes, whether he lost the Latino vote because he shifted, he was so anti-immigrant for basically a year and then suddenly on Tuesday, it sounded like he was for a comprehensive immigration reform. But what I do know is that these changing demographics are with us. And part of our problem, as I think about what our future elections will be like and what's in store for our democracy, are several things. First, the political machine, machinery likes to do things easy and uh, with no fuss. What do I mean by that? Over the last 40 years, Madison Avenue has infiltrated campaign operations. You do focus groups, you do polling, you get the right message. You know, our esteemed colleague George Lakoff in his writings about linguistics and how the messaging can be so critical. Well, what happens is the other type of organizing, the kind of organizing that Obama did in 2008 and others did before, requires person to person, recognizing that no one is just one thing and that you actually have to make that personal connection and actually have to talk about the issues in all of their complexity. So since the campaign machinery wants to do it easy, what do we have? We have a number of battleground states where you are spending a billion dollars, a billion. I think we should all be ashamed of that. And we also have every election cycle in presidential years, still a reducing part, a smaller and smaller part of the electorate actually bothering to vote, right? In 2008, we had the, one of the most exciting elections of a generation. And still, the total number who came out to vote, 52% of those eligible to vote. That means 48% didn't bother to show up. Why, you may ask. Well, I, a friend of mine, Laura Quinn at Catalyst, had a great line, which I give credit, and I think it sums it up. If Coke and Pepsi spend a billion dollars telling the public that the other drink was poison, what do you think the public would do? They'd say, forget it. And that's what's going on. This, um, this air war is turning people off in such a way that they're just not participating. The second thing that's going on, and I'm, again, a somewhat partisan, is in 2011 and 2012, we saw a flurry of legislation in various states reducing, uh, limiting the right to vote. And I have to say, I, I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, but it is very interesting, the states that decided to reduce early voting, to require um, voter IDs, proof of citizenship, purging of non-citizens. That's my favorite in Florida. Purging of non-citizens. Okay, tell me how you decide by looking at the voter roll who may not be a citizen. Duh. Does the name sound Hispanic or Creole? Well, let's send them a note to tell them they have to prove that they are a citizen. Right? Um, these efforts to reduce the franchise are very, very dangerous um, and do reflect, I think, as I said, I'll freely admit, it's a little bit of a conspiracy in my mind because how did this happen? But I think that in some ways I hold out some hope. If the demographics are as I've described, meaning we're complex Americans. I would hope that in election cycles, as we try to restore the franchise, as we try to make sure that it's easier to vote, my favorite proposal, I'll just say it, I've said it once, you want voter IDs? Let's change voting to Sundays. Let's, the rest of the world makes voting a holiday. Why do we make people take the days off from work? Um, are there same-day registration, um, easier ways to do voting? But if you, with these demographic changes, if it turns out that you really have to think about who you're talking to, perhaps we can return to the kind of political organizing that requires 
that interaction in which you are discussing issues and not simply bombarded by millions of dollars of negative advertising. I suspect I am uh, idealistic and a little bit um, naive. But nonetheless, I have to hope that we are able to recover our democracy um, as I am very concerned about the future. So let me stop on such a down note, but uh, I know we have questions.